Hi, my name is Kevin Alexander, and I'm your sessional instructor for interactive and multimedia learning. And um, I'm doing a lecture style today for the first module. And uh, the lecture kind of covers um, a few different topics. I'm going to go into interactive learning uh, and talk a bit about the history of that with a story. I'm going to go into multimedia learning and talk about some historical context on that subject as well. And then I'm going to talk about kind of what, what the digital versions and what we're interested in the most of interactive and multimedia learning. Um, but I'm going to end with kind of talking about story and narrative and its kind of importance. Um, and you're going to hear me use some different techniques. I'm going to try to use some storytelling uh, actually in this lecture today, just as an example of how important story can be in different versions of it. So um, I hope there's a lot of content in here that we can use in the discussions on the forum um, and that you can further explore with some of the readings we have today. So uh, here we go with module one. Thanks. So in um, 2001 and 2002, my wife and I, um, we decided to quit our jobs and travel around the world as people do. And um, we did it because we just wanted to experience something new and do something different in life and experience different things in the world. And um, we journaled a lot during the trip. We knew, and we've kept these journals to this day. We've kept them. And um, in 2002, kind of in the kind of February, March, we found ourselves in East Africa and we wanted to do a camping safari. And to that point on the trip, we actually hadn't done very many organized tours or anything like that. We had kind of just done it ourselves. But when, in East Africa, we decided, let's do one of these kind of organized camping safaris. You participate a lot. You get together with other people on the safari. You set up tents. It's kind of like being in a collective and you help cook food and clean up and everything. It's a great experience and you see tons of animals and wildlife. And a really exciting part spot for us or a really exciting point in the trip for us was being with the Maasai, um, you know, a centuries old tribe in East Africa. And um, on one of the days uh, we were there, we were fortunate enough to get to go on a walking tour one morning. And, and I, the amazing thing is I found it in our journal. It was on February 25th, uh, 2002. And it's one of the days where we journaled literally the most. Like we wrote pages and even drew drawings that day. And, and I remember that because it was probably one of the most effective interactive learning experience I've ever had in my life. A nature walk with the Maasai is incredible because there was five Maasai warriors. There was one chief and there was also a guy named Joseph and this was kind of his camp, if you will. And we walked out on this trek going up into what was called the Luida Hills. And so, so many things are vivid in my memory. We learned about how Maasai, you know, when they want to be friends with you, they just hold your hands. So some of the guides just you know warriors held the hands of people in our group and at first it was really awkward but then you learn like that's how they just show that you they want you to come along with you i remember learning about this certain brand this certain tree and they call it you know, some people call it the toothbrush tree and that these twigs they chop them off with their kind of maasai knife and they kind of chew on the end of it and it, it, they brush their teeth with it and it's incredibly effective learned about this small little antelope called the dick dick that kind of mates for life like all these memories I have and things that I learned and that I wanted to document them. It was this incredible experience. In, in kind of in multimedia learning or interactive learning, we often talk about synchronous learning and asynchronous learning. Synchronous, synchronous learning is kind of real time. It's like having a teacher talk to you in front of a class. It's linear. Asynchronous learning is um, learning that somebody can kind of jump out of time and experience something at their own pace in a way that they want. They can choose their own adventure. So even like a video like this is a fairly linear thing, but the option to choose when you watch the video and at what pace and what else you want to do would be asynchronous learning. And this nature walk, the incredible thing about it was it absolutely had both. I could stay right with the lead um, chief and walk with him and hear his talk as he's walking us through these hills. But I could actually stop and look down and see a flower or see an animal or talk to somebody else. And then I'd see something that I'd want to ask a question. So I'd walk up to another of the warriors and I'd ask him something. He'd ask me something. There was this constant going in and out of time, linear and non-linear, synchronous, asynchronous learning. It was an incredible, the most interactive experience I've had in my life. And so this primitive walking, primitive walking tour we were on 
which is modeled on the type of learning Maasai tribes have used for centuries in teaching their children became the most effective interactive learning experience I've ever been a part of. That is interactive learning. And it's been around for hundreds of years. In 1658, John Amos Comunis' Orbus Pictus was published. Robert Mayer, the current kind of research guru on multimedia learning, references the book, Orbus Pictus, Comunis' book, as one of the first instances of text and hand-drawn images being used specifically for educating. Communist's book was intended for children. It was essentially an encyclopedia, if you will, with words grouped based on location, like a barber shop, and then hand-drawn images were placed in with the words in the text. Almost everyone in any culture in the world has kids reading books like this. We use them as kids. It started in the mid-17th century, and it caught on right away. It was a popular book for its time, for sure. What makes it significant is it really is a first use of an intended multimedia learning technique. Break it apart, and multimedia is many mediums. And a medium is a way or a method for conveying information. Comenius used two mediums, images and text, in a purposeful learning way. And by the way, the plural of medium is media, I know. But the word media is kind of far too synonymous with current events and news. So I'll often use the word mediums as the plural for medium, which to me is kind of a perfectly acceptable plural form of the word, as far as I'm concerned. But Comenius did not randomly come up with the idea for the book. Some of the core ideas he used to create multimedia content are still used today, like using objects instead of just words, using images and words, using familiarity, like the setting that he put the different pages of the books in and also focus on learning being fun. So almost 400 years ago, multimedia learning was intentionally used. Multimedia learning, 400 years ago. Fast forward to today, where we want to understand and effectively use interactive and multimedia learning in our lives. And we think digital. There's nothing wrong with focusing on digital, the digital use of interactivity and multimedia gives us new opportunities in learning that were more difficult to achieve before the digital revolution. We use things like PowerPoint and video and audio and using them all together every day. For one, digital techniques can enhance learning. Research by Richard Meyer on multimedia learning shows that learning outcomes can be increased with effective use of multimedia. And we'll stress effective, and we'll talk about that later in another module. Digital learning techniques allow us to distribute non-linearly and widely. So they enhance distribution. We can go really wide. An online course at a university like this, or an interactive video manual, let's say for you know mechanics who fix cars and those cars are available worldwide, they can get the content when and where they need it. So distribution is something that the digital versions of these techniques enhance. And finally, effective use of multimedia and interactive learning can make learning more effect, more accessible and individual, kind of whether through translation or ease of providing dedicated content to an individual. So picture just a video that you use to train a whole class versus kind of looking at the class and looking at the learning levels they're at and using a different video for each portion of the class. So if you will... Digital versions of interactive learning and multimedia learning let us enhance distribution and they also let us just enhance those techniques and they also let us make things more accessible for the individual. But kind of our prior knowledge we all have living in a digital and educated part of the world is a potential trap that in my mind can kind of limit us from drawing on past experiences and techniques that are more connected to our digital lives than we may kind of realize or know. So think of this example. So let's say you have a background and experience in making movies um, or presentations, PowerPoint, websites, whatever it is. You have some technical background in this digital gobbledygook. 
have you stopped to think how the effective use of those technologies may be gleaned from learning situations where those tools weren't even present? Can you learn from multimedia done hundreds of years ago or done a hundred years ago or done with the original turning point in photography? Can you learn about these techniques to influence the way you use them digitally? And yes, I think you can. Or for example, let's say you have a background in education. Whether it's teaching or creating marketing or sales information, you may know that our researched understanding of learning has moved through a, in kind of a, a progression, of a, a progression through kind of the means of education delivery. And that where we're currently at this mode of it's all about constructive and interactive learning. But have we considered that interactive learning is not something new? but something that has been done for hundreds of years, that it's not something new that we're figuring out how to do today, that we have a lifelong chance to look at experiences in our lives and the lives of people gone by to learn about interactive learning. So as we embark in learning about this digital learning topic, let's make sure we consider learning devices and techniques that exist outside of the digital realm as well. There's another trap when focusing on interactive and multimedia learning. And it's that recognizing that these techniques are essentially an empty vessel or empty vessels if they're not filled up with stories. So like the story I shared at the beginning of the Maasai and the, and, and, and the kind of nature walk, if you will, um, these are so important. And maybe not, it doesn't have to be an elaborate story like that, but stories are really important. So studying multimedia and interactivity without considering storytelling would be like learning filmmaking without studying script writing. If we want to foster effective learning, we can't drop story. And, but the crazy thing is we do it all the time. The best example of forgetting about story is when we use multimedia to transfer or construct new knowledge with technology products. So often a new product comes along and it requires us to do some new trick, some new way to use it. And so we have manuals and user documentation and we have user help. We can ask questions to support, to get the answers to our questions. But the thing is with story, less people would even need to ask a question to support because they would learn in a way where they don't even know that they're learning. I'll give you a specific example. I uh, worked for a company that designed products for singers. These were kind of a physical product you'd mount on your mic stand when you sung with a microphone and they would affect the sound of your voice and let you be more creative as a singer. And in 2009, we released a product where the whole front of the interface of the product was touch, but not like a touch screen. It was like a painted on interface and you could touch anywhere to use it. And it had a slider actually that could change settings in the product. Well, the iPhone had only been out for like a year and a year and a half. So people weren't actually that familiar with sliding yet. And when we test the product before we shipped it, we found that people couldn't figure that out and they kind of get frustrated. And if we showed them and showed them, oh, you do this and you do that, they go, okay, they try it and they'd start to like it and use it. But we know with kind of product use, if you don't, if they have trouble with it at the beginning, they just return the product, they don't use it. So it's really important to us in this product that we got them understanding and learning about this slider early. And we came up with a technique that actually worked really, really well. We kind of said, people don't want this as a feature in the product. They don't know they want a slider. So what we did is whenever we demonstrated the product live at trade shows or in video, we would use a song. And the song would always start by seeing the artists use the slider to select a sound in the product. And we'd see them do it and show them do it. Or in a live demo, we'd show them do it and have video footage of them doing it. And at the end of the song, kind of the bookend, if you will, the, the song would end with this cool sounding effect that would be triggered by them sliding with their finger. And that's how the song would end. At live trade shows, when we do this, we'd literally have people watch the demo and then go to kind of our interactive center where the products were there and you could try them out. And everyone would just start out with the slider. They had learned about the slider without even knowing they were learning about the slider. They were just experiencing a great song. A song is just another form of a story. Stories are so effective at carrying information and transferring information. Stories at the base level, what they do is they get people interested. Often the challenge we have in learning is who wants to read a manual? Who wants to learn something? So 
the, the trouble is just getting people's attention and stories are so good at getting people's attention. Just when somebody starts telling a story in a room, we naturally want to listen. So stories increase your audience by just getting these people listening, if you will. But the research behind narrative, and there is a lot of it, and story points to a pervasive and deep connection to every type of learning outcome, in digital or not. In fact, no matter how much technology increases its value at enhancing learning, it is trumped by story, in that learning is not nearly as effective without narrative. So if I was gonna summarize some of the things that I've said today, I would say that interactive and multimedia learning are in fact century old techniques. They're not new, but they're so important because they can increase learning outcomes. We've seen this historically and we can measure it today. The digital incarnations of these techniques are important, not only for increasing learning outcomes, but also for enhancing those outcomes by providing easy and wide distribution and independent accessibility to learning. But these techniques, as I said before, they're empty vessels without the presence of story. So I hope you can take some of the stuff from this lecture today and follow on in some of the readings that are on online on course spaces and then jump into the forum. I encourage you to talk about the readings on the forum, to talk about the topics that I've started, but you can even start some topics directly out of some of the content in the lecture I provided today. I look forward to talking to you again in module two. Thanks.